If we have time, I might tell the story of how one of those got stolen by Somali pirates. Okay. No. <laughs> Though, if you ask the pirates, that's a whole other story. <laughs> Getting started. Um, welcome to Securing the Weird. I'm Susan Sons. And this is a talk about mental models that can help you secure things and deal with technologies and situations that are unfamiliar. This is my day job. I secure a number of things that get dropped in my lap by everyone from DHS to the National Science Foundation to I've worked on projects for Department of Energy, for private R&D, for the Department of Defense. And I love it because I get to work with all of these interesting technologies. But let me tell you, when you have sensor networks under the Antarctic ice, when you have a really cool telescope with a special laser, I don't know if you can see the laser beam coming out of that in the time lapse, it's really cool, that makes fake stars in the upper atmosphere for telescope calibration. When you have autonomous underwater vehicles and ships with their own internal ICS and SCADA networks that have tons of scientific instrumentation and only a D-band satellite signal going out, or any of the other weird things that I work on, it usually doesn't come with a best practice list. So suck in the cool photos because this is gonna be your last science photo till the end. And the way I'm approaching this for this talk is a little bit different than what you may have seen before because I'm not going to pack a bunch of technical cybersecurity skills or infosec skills into your head in one hour. The reason I'm not doing that is there's only so much I can teach you in an hour. And I don't know what everyone's walking in with. We're going to have some people who are really familiar with the discipline and some people aren't. Instead, I'm going to try to teach you three mental models that get me through this kind of work and that can apply it to many other types of technical work where you have to deal with unknowns. So here's the rough roadmap here. I'm going to start with why checklists alone aren't sufficient, why mental models are a useful way to approach complex tasks, I'm going to show you three mental models, and then I'm going to wrap up with ways that you can use this in your own work, and of course, time for Q&A. And feel free to interrupt me at any point. If I use a term you're unfamiliar with, or if you come up with a question, I'm totally cool with being interrupted. It keeps things interesting. Um, and because I move through so many communities day to day, one day it's DOD, the next day it's scientists, the next day it's the hacker community, I pull words from all of them and I don't even think about it. It's like people who just mix their native language in with English and then the other language that they learned in college and forget that other people don't know all four languages that they speak. It's a bad habit, call me on it. Um, so second, section one is there be dragons. Um, I spend a lot of time off the map where best practices lists just can't save you. Sometimes there's just, just no list. Um, like I said, my wonderful uh, telescope that has the special laser. Um, this is really cool. This is one of my favorite parts of this telescope installation. Um, the reason that this telescope gets, this is the Gemini telescope, by the way. The reason that their photos from on top of Mauna Kea, which is a dormant volcano in Hawaii, are as clear as Hubble telescope photos, despite being taken from Earth, is they have a computational system that will measure the distortion being introduced to a picture by the movement of the atmosphere and compensate for it. And the way that they do this is, if any of you have watched stars twinkle, Stars don't really twinkle. What you're seeing is the steady light of a star filtered through the movement of the atmosphere, and it looks like stars twinkle. And if the telescope takes a picture of a star near to the thing that it's looking at, by measuring the twinkle of the star, it can tell what movement of the atmosphere it needs to compensate for to get other things in space into a clear picture. The problem is there isn't always a distant star near the thing that you're trying to take a picture of. So sometimes they make one, 
They have this really cool laser that will basically cook bits of potassium in the upper atmosphere to make them glow. And now they have a fake star and they can watch it twinkle and they can tell which way the atmosphere is moving and they can calibrate their system and they can have a very clear picture. It's pretty cool, but let me tell you that does not come with a security best practices list. I had to make this up when I got there. Um, and a lot of times we get caught up in what I call death by checklists. People have this blind belief that if there are directions and they follow the directions, they're doing it right. And I'm a huge fan of checklists when used correctly. And in a later mental model, I'll get to how you build checklists so that they're more likely to be used correctly. But when I talk about death by checklists, there are a couple of things that commonly go really, really wrong. First of all, people are so desperate to have a checklist, they will take a checklist that was not built for the situation at hand and apply it because it's a checklist and therefore it must be better than having no instructions whatsoever. The next thing is people will not understand that checklists are for known situations and when they encounter an exception, they'll fail to deviate from the checklist. And the third thing that tends to go horribly wrong is people accept a checklist without actually reading into it and finding out if it's reasonable or not. Because it's a checklist, it must be good. I don't let any of these things go wrong in my projects when I can help it, but it helps to be really aware of this and also to have concrete ways to short circuit it. Because the way we end up with death by checklists, and I'll get into this when I talk about people models, is that people want a framework to work on so that they don't have to recompute, refigure out what to do every time they do a task. And that's a smart thing, that's a good instinct. It increases our ability to do something correctly when we have to do it many times. You don't sit down and really reason about how should I brush my teeth today? Nobody has time for that. You get up and you brush your teeth the way you did the last 4,000 times you brushed your teeth, right? So these are a lot of the things that I'm just kind of accustomed to at this point. Um, working with science is weird, and that's why I've had enough practice at this that I've developed these mental models. One is low or no connectivity. Like I said, I have a ship that generates tons of data, and it has this incy-wincy D-band satellite connection out to the world, and that's all it's got. And by the way, if the weather's bad enough, that just goes away. Not that they don't have bigger problems in rough seas. Um, extreme temperatures, um, one of those facilities you saw in my picture is called Ice Cube. That's where they gather the data from all of these sensor nets under the Antarctic ice where they're doing measurements of neutrinos. So really delicate science and um, I love when people tell me, oh, just push out a new firmware load, it'll be fine. No, I have to wait for the thaw. It's under the ice in Antarctica. It's not that simple in my world. Um, dealing with salt water and sea air, which can be very corrosive to computing equipment. Um, dealing with volcanic activity. Some of my projects actually have to worry about that. Seasonal access to equipment, like I just mentioned for Ice Cube. Um, not designed by IT professionals. Here's a really fun one. Working with the science community, and I run into this in DOD as well, you have to get a design approved and funded before you're allowed to hire IT professionals. So you could have soldiers or scientists designing a system, and then later they bring in someone who you know, actually does IT for a living and has some experience at this. So you have to work around the things that went wrong in that process before an IT professional was even in the story. Um, often we don't control the network, let alone everything on it. Some of the work I do is with science projects that are homed at major universities. So the university owns the network. One of the problems we've had to solve is how do you do network monitoring when you don't own any of the network hardware and you're not allowed to access the span ports? That's just our life. We learn to work around it. Um, and another interesting thing is not in all of the communities I work with, but particularly when I'm working with open science, Nobody usually cares about confidentiality. Your worst case scenario is you're trying to keep your pre-publication data secret so nobody scoops you on something that's coming up in a couple of months. But overall, 
if scientists, if you're like data exfiltration, I'll, I love when a vendor tries to sell me some product that's going to stop data exfiltration. And my scientists are like, no, take my data. Can I help you take my data? I can't believe you're interested in my data. Can I tell you about my data? Can I buy you dinner and bore you about my data? No, some of the data is actually really interesting, but this is the response from scientists. Please take my data. Can I have a citation when you take my data? Can, will you put my name on it after you take my data? Like, that's all I want. You can have my data. And that's life with open science. They really care about integrity. They really care about availability. And confidentiality, what's that? So it's a different world to work in. And boy, do we confuse security vendors, let me tell you. <laughs> Please take my data. So what is a mental model and why do I think these are important enough to share? Um, the definition from Wikipedia is up here. I'm not going to read it to you as if we are in the sixth grade. Um, but basically, we think about doing repetitive tasks or processes on a computer. Once you've done it enough to kind of know what, how it works, what's the first thing you do? You script it, right? Mental models are scripts for the human brain. These are ways of thinking about complex problems that break them into variables or elements that we understand how they relate to one another. So now we have something where instead of walking into a jumble or a mess, I have pieces I can manipulate. And it's a very powerful way of reducing complicated situations into something that you can work on very, com very confidently over and over. So as I go into new situations, I start building mental models to deal with situations that are like that. And most of the brightest, most adaptable people I know have a huge collection of mental models that they've just adopted, created, or learned from other people over time. And that's how we take really complicated things that you can't do with a checklist, especially things that require human analysis and reasoning, and put them into something that starts to have a structure. So the three mental models I'm going to introduce you to are, first of all, the information security practice principles, which is a way to do information security from first principles, rather than relying on getting too far into the weeds where the knowledge that you have expires when you move from working with one technology to working with a new technology. Um, what I call three minds and how to use them, um, the cowboy, the engineer, and the anthropologist. This is a way of looking at a complicated systems problem and making sure that you're covering your bases and not just moving too fast, dropping things, or only seeing part of the problem. Um, I find this especially helpful when I don't have my entire team to work with because I consider a lot of them to be a safety valve. I work with people who think differently than I do. And when I do not have that safety valve, a way that I help myself think and analyze better is to sort of have these caricatures and say I'm going to think this way first and then I'm going to try to take, go back and do the same problem with this mindset and then I'm going to try it with a third mindset. And that gives me some of that 360 view that I might not have had otherwise. And the last one is the concept of evidence-based information security. How do you get from something that is a special snowflake all its own to something that's repeatable by other people who don't live and work in chaos like I do? How do I make normal people able to do this? And then at the end, when we get past the mental models, we'll talk about using this. So working from first principles. By the way, speaking of first principles, everyone who attends this talk is going to get one of these handy ref cards with the information security practice principles on it. And the first people who ask me really good questions at any point in this talk are going to get books. So start thinking. So we have seven principles here. And I'm going to do a really quick run through on what they mean and how they play out. But all information security can be derived from these seven principles. My team at Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research spent a lot of time hashing this out and a lot of research because when we started looking at how do we really do this, how do we figure out how to secure something that nobody's secured before, 
we realized that there were some principles at play. And then we started to realize as we looked for resources we could use in communicating this with others, they hadn't ever really been documented. This was hard-won knowledge from people who'd been in the trenches a long time. So this was the outcome of a really long research project that you'll get the URL to learn more about later. Um, comprehensivity covering all your bases. Um, a perfect example of comprehensivity is end-to-end -end encryption. Too often we see situations where, okay, the connection from the client to server is encrypted, that's great. It's unencrypted on the server and then it gets encrypted again to send to the other client, but it's okay, if we attack the server we'll get everything. Totally cool. Um, comprehensivity is really about looking at everything because an attacker finds the weakest point. They only have to find one flaw. As defenders, we need to look after all the flaws. Opportunity is a big one that I see as a huge failing in our industry right now. Because let me tell you, when a group of script kiddies find out about a new exploit, they're passing it around so fast. I've seen things go from, we heard of this, to turned into a Metasploit package and active attacks across three continents in less than six hours. It happens. Here on the defender side, we do not share information that freely and that widely. We just don't. And it is often our downfall. A lot of it's fear. Um, people don't want to say what they're afraid of and what their liability is because they're afraid somebody they're talking to might be one of the bad guys. Yeah, people are, real, people are often as afraid to listen as they are to talk, and there's this fear of being wrong and it being my fault that happens a lot in industry, especially because we've really, because many parts of our industry are older and further along than information security is, we've conditioned people that it's safe to stick to known processes. And so much around InfoSec is kind of new that everything looks risky and people don't know what to do. The other thing is there seems to be this pervasive belief that if we shut up and don't tell people what we're concerned about, no one will make an exploit for it. And that is so not true. Um, I saw a wonderful, I can't tell you the entire contents, but I saw a wonderful government produced chart that had like this pyramid with the difficulty of different kinds of cybersecurity threats. And you know, at the bottom there's the stuff that board kids and script kiddies do, and it goes all the way up to um, at the very tippy top state actors. Except where do you think they put zero days? State actors. Do you know how many zero days I've seen discovered by a bored 14-year-old who just pushed buttons because he had nothing better to do on hour, for hours on end? And this, yeah, many of them, because it's mildly more amusing than Minecraft and is approximately the same waste of your time. Um, so, but, but they were absolutely sure that zero days are something that come from state actors. And... I, I was just baffled by this, and it's, they, they seriously seemed to believe that most information security attackers were just not going to come up with zero days if they shut their mouths. Don't talk about it. And that's really sad because there's so many opportunities we miss. You have no, well, maybe you know because some of you do similar work, but I go into so many situations and clients and say, okay, we're going to start securing this. Where's your network map? Where's your software architecture diagram? They have the home court advantage and they can't tell me what they have. You know, they just, why would you give that up? It's your terrain, you should know it better than everybody else. You know, invading forces should be at a disadvantage, but too often they're not because we're wasting that opportunity. We're not taking advantage of our environment. So, and by the way, I owe you a book for the first question. The, uh, so rigor, what's correct behavior and how am I ensuring it? 
An example of a rigor rule is never trust the vendor. My vendor says all connections to this device are encrypted by default. Trust but verify, exactly. Um, I, I Believe me, I'm going to be sniffing everything in and out of that device to find out if they really are encrypted and how. Um, also, it means following up on people. One of the things that I frequently see in organizations is that, and we'll get to people problems later on, but I frequently find out that, okay, it's great, we have a security policy, it makes sense, we approved it, and we put it in the drawer, and we didn't bother to tell anyone about it. That's a lack of rigor. If you have a security process or policy and you haven't told anyone about it, I, how many of you work in an organization made entirely of psychics? Anybody? Because I sure don't. <laughs> we might have a few psychos, but I haven't confirmed that yet. But seriously, these are failures of rigor. Rigor is about checking on things, it's about monitoring, and it's about follow through. If you think you're gonna do something, that's not enough. You have to actually say you're going to do it and then you have to actually do it. Yep. Yep, test that it fails correctly. Um, and that gets us down to fault tolerance, number six. Um, minimization, and I'm going to make you all listen to my favorite minimization story because I'm not so, I feel like a bad mother. I have a favorite among my children, but I do. And it's minimization because I get to be more secure by doing less work. I like this. I like doing less work. So here's a great example. Many of you, by virtue of coming to SELF before, are familiar with the NTP Security Project. Um, when the NTP Sec fork started, we had just gotten through a rescue where a lot of the build tools, code accessibility and stuff were straightened out. We hadn't gotten to do any major architectural changes at this point from the original code base. And what we call NTP Classic was continually maintained under its old development principles. So we had this interesting case study because we started with the same code and then it was maintained using two separate strategies, okay? And the NTP set crew in the first year really didn't have time to do a major re-architecture because they had so many moving parts and things to deal with getting the project up and running. But what they did do was remove quite a lot of code, code that was theoretically unreachable, code that supported hardware that no longer existed on the planet code that supposedly had already been rendered out of, so that it would never compile, but could compile under some circumstances. Code that wasn't actually getting used, but had been left compiling in for reasons we didn't really understand. They were compiling code that, no, that should never run because the logic of the rest of the program should never call it. Okay. Yeah, if false, do this. Things like that. Um, so, but so there are glitches. Things can reach theoretically unreachable code. So, by around the same time that this fork was started, there was a college professor who decided that NTP, being the aging code base that it was, would be great fodder for some of her software security students. So she set them loose and said, see how many software bugs you can find in the NTP reference implementation. And boy, those bugs started rolling in. The thing is, not giving NTP, I'm not giving NTP set credit for any of the security flaws that we found and fixed, okay? I'm not even counting those only counting the things that we did not know about until they were disclosed by a third party. NTPSEC dodged approximately 85% of the security vulnerabilities through minimization alone, through removing code they didn't need, but that had been left in the code base. 
That's incredibly powerful. I'm going to maintain less stuff and be more secure. I love that. I'm going to have fewer interfaces and be more secure. Absolutely. Removing packages from your operating system counts as minimization. Minimization means being a smaller target, retaining less stuff the bad guys want. Don't hold on to data you don't need. Why are you collecting people's social security numbers? Do you really need that data? Or did somebody go crazy with the input form? Let's stop and think about this. How long do you really have to retain that data? So one of them is being a smaller target. The other one is about having a smaller attack surface, having less code, having fewer services running, having fewer ports open, having fewer machines that can talk to one another. Um, compartmentation is another what I kind of consider the architectural principles. Compartmentation is having discrete parts that have limited known interfaces. This is about having good, tight, carefully defined internal and external APIs. This is about network segmentation. This is about not storing your highly critical secret data in the same place that you put your promotional video game for your company. Because the people who should have access to these files are probably very different. They should probably be in separate worlds. So that's what compartmentation is about. Fault tolerance. What happens if this fails? Everything fails. Your firewall may be great, but one day it's going to have a bug. So shouldn't that be what happens when this fails? Yeah, what happens when this fails? The, uh, someday it's going to have a bug. Your software may be great, someday it's going to have a bug. More than one thing should have to go wrong for a crisis to happen. This used to be how we thought about complex systems. Um, if you look at how nuclear regulation is set up, everything has a fail-safe. And the degree to which you need fail-safes depends a lot on your actual application domain. I don't expect a video game to have the same level of fail-safes as a medical device. These are very different things. But let's stop and think here. Even a video game company stands to lose money if one thing going down takes down their entire server network, right? They still have failover, they still have backups. What happens when this fails? And finally, proportionality, is this worth it? I can make your computer perfectly secure, okay? It's never gonna get broken into. This is gonna be fantastic. I'm gonna get my sledgehammer, and I'm going to break your computer into eensy-weensy little tiny bits. And then we're going to encase the bits in cement. And then we're going to drop this cement computer bit ball down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. This is fantastic. Nobody can even do data recovery on that by the time the seawater gets to it. Unfortunately, you won't be getting a whole lot of work done either. That, that's just a minor side effect, right? Yeah, not so much. The idea of doing information security is to further a mission. If you're at a university, it's an educational mission. If you're in a company, it's the company's mission and the company's profits and the company's ability to continue to employ people. If you are on a science project, it's going to be discovery. What are you trying to accomplish here and how do people trust your science? If you're in the military, it's going to be a military mission. But there is some mission that you're trying to ensure continues on. You know. Um, Someone recently asked me about the security of GPS systems, and we mapped out a few, a few emergency scenarios and the various things that can and often do go wrong. And they said, you know, but we're looking at, and they showed me all the vendor options for backup systems that are ever more complicated technologies. And I'm like, so you realize that for 20% of the price of that, you can buy really high-end maps and compasses and train all of your people in basic orienteering, right? Just a thought. <laughs> and the guy looked at me with such a stunned expression. Because we're talking about a fairly rare scenario in which the GPS system is largely down. Working around that from a technological standpoint is complicated, failure prone, and expensive. But what do you really want? Do you really want your GPS units to keep functioning? Or do you really want to know how to get from here to there? 
Just for the record, they bought the compasses. <laughs> But that's what proportionality is about. It's also about, as security people, going in and not being the bad guy because there is this archetype out there in the world of the security people being there to tell you, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that, it's not secure. That's not what I'm here for. You have a job to get done. I want to know what your real goals are, and then we'll figure out a way to get there. And we'll figure out how much risk we can handle and what we can and can't do and what it costs. That's what proportionality is about, and we're not going to do it if it's not worthwhile. So these are things we use the principles for, and I apologize. I thought I picked better colors that would look better on a projector. It's a little hard to read. Um, this URL has a PDF of the ref cards I'm going to give out if you'd like to print them. It also has a free downloadable academic white paper on where the principles came from and how we came up with them. Um, and it's got a lot of other information on the principles and we'll tell you when we do trainings and things. But these are some of the things that we use the principles for constantly. A big one is communication. The I cannot underestimate the power of getting the lawyers, the C-suite, the sysadmins, the programmers, the security people, and everyone else throughout the company using the same words to describe what they're trying to accomplish. That's what DevOps was supposed to be, but they didn't really accomplish it when it came to security. Um, we had, especially when it came to roping in the policy folks in the C-suite. Because what happened was we may have gotten the tech people fairly integrated, but it didn't make it up to the business risk level. And for managing a lot of security threats, they still didn't have a shared vocabulary. Um, strategy. We always have to talk about trade-offs and we always have to talk about what are we going to invest in and what are we going to value more than something else. This gives, again, that shared vocabulary and the ability to say, what are the trade-offs? Okay, I'm getting more rigor, I've built in more monitoring, but I've also created more points of attack because now I have sensitive data in more places. It gives people an ability to really start to analyze those trade-offs. It's a, like I said, it's a mental model for things. It gives us an organized approach that can be shared for having these discussions. Root cause analysis is a great one because so often I hear from security people, well, we found the cause of that breach. Somebody didn't patch Apache struts. <sighs> okay. Let's go back and talk about this. Let's talk about the fact that a bug in Apache struts lost your entire user database and all their financial information because you didn't practice fault tolerance. And there was no real fallback and there was no real monitoring to know that it was happening. Let's talk about minimization. Why is all this stuff installed on my database server? Let's talk about opportunity. Why don't we have an asset inventory that told us that we had Apache struts installed? Let's talk about rigor. Why wasn't anyone installing updates across the board on everything we had that needed to be updated? Let's talk about proportionality. Is anyone even really aware about the risk levels within our infrastructure and how they map to our actual business purpose? That gets us back to root cause analysis because too often systemic problems don't get fixed because somebody finds a nasty symptom and writes it off as the cause. This helps us get closer to root causes. Architecture is a big one. I'm a huge fan of fixing architecture because just like I used in my minimization example with NTPSEC, I can't find every security bug. I am really, really good and I will not find every security bug. But what I can do is constantly bring things closer to an architecture that will have fewer bugs. And then I fix the bugs that I find. And that gives me a lot more bang for my buck, and it's a lot better than playing whack-a-mole. Because you can't find every bug. But if you get rid of code you're not using, any bugs in that code just became irrelevant. If you separate critical parts of the code from the rest of the code base, this now means that you can make fairly safe changes to things like 
data storage without screwing up your crypto. And let me tell you, most people on your team, you don't want them working on your crypto. You probably don't want to be doing your crypto in-house unless you're a very special snowflake. It also helps with evaluating tools and standards. Remember when I talked about checklists and said that one of the problems is that people blindly accept checklists without evaluating them? One of the saddest things for me is to go in as a security expert in the aftermath of a big breach or another big problem, and I'm looking at this team. In this case, it, in the case I'm thinking of right now, it was a DevOps team, and they were all just crestfallen. They're like, we think we did everything right. And they're showing me the best practice list from the vendor of their product. And I read the security best practice list. And for the record, the product was WordPress that ultimately caused the breach. And one of the things that WordPress tells you is all of these executable files must be writable by the web server. Yeah, I see people cringing out there, and you should be. Yeah, a number of people cringe at the term WordPress, but... Um, so they had followed every best practice on WordPress's security guide. Unfortunately, some of the best practices were wrong. They were simply wrong. They were poor choices. And they didn't know. They didn't know enough security to know that this was wrong. But if we look at our list here, let's consider this. A web server that has right access to all of the executable files in your CMS. Well, we have a problem with compartmentation because this is definitely not a separation of concerns. This is like that guy who gives the CEO root on everything even though he's non-technical because he's the boss and he said so. This is not minimization. You have not minimized your attack surface. This is definitely not fault tolerance because anything that can get the web server to write things can now execute arbitrary code on your machine with elevated privileges. If you know this, you know when the list is wrong. And that's why I love this mental model. So this is how far we've made it. We have two mental models to go. The cowboy, the anthropologist, and the engineer. So I'm a fan of policy. Um, most tech people won't tell you that they love policy, but I love policy. Um, and here's why I love policy. For those of you who've ever played like fantasy RPGs, having a really well-written policy is like knowing a bureaucrat's true name. It's, what do you mean I can't do that? It's in the policy right here. And they just go away. It's like magic. It's wonderful, and hackers don't always realize this, this power because we're like, okay, it's a policy, but it's dumb. But no, it, it, it completely works. So getting involved in policy so the policy is smart is actually really, really helpful. But policy only helps you with the things that we saw coming. You can't write something in a policy if you don't know it's going to happen, which is why well-written policies have exceptions. And if you take the mind when you write policy that this is for all the things we planned for and all the things we didn't plan for we're going to have to improvise and are not in this policy, you're going to be in a good place. And that's when we come to the cowboy and the engineer. And again, I apologize for the readability. Um, the cowboy is ready to jump into any situation, is comfortable acting on incomplete information, the cowboy inspires change, and when the cowboy's done, the cowboy rides off into the sunset. Because that's what the cowboy does. The engineer makes results repeatable even by those who are less skilled than him or herself. The engineer ensures correctness. The engineer creates steadiness, and the engineer plans ahead. When these two things come together, whether it's a team working together or a person who can handle both mindsets, it can be an unstoppable force. Because what happens is being able to analyze the situation and deal with the fact that you don't know everything but create steadiness for others gives other people confidence and they can calm down. They can be productive and helpful. Being able to create the change you need right now while knowing what's going on so that you can make it repeatable later is incredibly powerful because the cowboy doesn't want to be there to keep the trains running on time. And we'll talk about a mental model for this in the last mental model. Um, but this is a really important balance, 
and it comes back to the cowboy will make sure it gets done right right now while we're in an exigent circumstance. The engineer will make sure that whatever happens, there's a post-mortem, we figured out why it happened, what may have gone wrong, how to fix it in the future, and build it back into the policy for next time. So didn't I mention an anthropologist? When it's not just a one-off, if it's a pervasive technology problem, it's almost always really a people problem. And I have seen this time and time and time again. Oh. Oh. Whoever has to edit this is going to have fun. <laughs> Apologies to whoever has to edit this video. As I was saying, pervasive technology problems are pretty much invariably people problems at the root. 